This morning, friends, we're going to be looking at Genesis 3. There are Bibles in the back if you want to grab one. If you didn't get one on the way in, you can use a Bible app. But we're going to be reading the whole thing, so you may want to have it, you have it available to you. Genesis 3. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. Last week, we read about creation and our shared story of creation. Today, we read about what's been traditionally called the fall, the fall into sin in Genesis chapter 3. We'll be reading the entire chapter, Genesis 3. Hear the word of the Lord. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must touch it or you'll die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. He's like the worst player of hide-and-seek ever. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the, the woman, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? The woman said, the uh, serpent. The serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity or hatred between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains and childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband. He will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, the man's now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. This is the word of the Lord. So how many of you ever in the history of your life have ever fallen down? Yes, every one of us. Every one of us has fallen down at some point or another. When we're learning how to walk, when we're learning how to ride a bike, we've slipped on the ice. We've all done those falls where we fall and we stumble and we're like, nobody saw that, everything's good, I'm fine. We've all done that. Most of the time when we fall, we can pick ourselves up and dust ourselves off and, and move on. 
Most of the time when we fall, we don't get hurt, and even if we get hurt, usually we don't get hurt very badly. And most of the time when we fall, no one else gets hurt. Now, historically, traditionally, this story from Genesis has been referred to as the fall, as in the fall into sin or the fall away from God. But that's not actually the best word because Adam and Eve in this story can't pick themselves up. They can't dust themselves off and just go on as if everything has happened. Nothing to see here, nothing happened. What they actually did is tear apart their relationship with God. They just ripped it apart. Eating that fruit was an act of rebellion. It was a mutiny. It was saying to God, eh, we don't want to, we don't want to work with you anymore. We don't want you to be the boss of us. We've got this other thing here telling us different things, and we would rather listen to this. Your rules don't apply to us anymore. We are now going to take matters into our own hands and do what we want. And it's tempting for us to read this story from Genesis and say, ah, if only those two hadn't messed up, we would still be in Eden. Everything would be great. We would be chilling out, eating fruit, having fun. Stupid Adam, stupid Eve, ruined it for everyone. But you know, the, the truth is, I would have eaten the fruit. You would have eaten the fruit. And we know that with confidence because we still eat the fruit. We rebel against God all the time. We tell him, eh, your rules don't really apply to me. I think I'll take matters into my own hands. Thank you very much. I can drive as fast as I want. That rule doesn't really apply to me. I can give or not give to the church. That rule doesn't really apply to me. I can hit my brother. I can steal my sister's candy. I can ignore my wife. Those rules don't really apply to me. I can do what I want. I'm the boss of me. So if you remember from last week, these stories in Genesis are designed to teach us about ourselves and to teach us about God. So what does the story teach us about ourselves? That we are selfish little tyrants, just like Adam and Eve, and we always want our own way. This is not a surprise. This is not like a news bulletin. I mean, have you, have you met us? This is, this is what we do. This is who we are. But what's fascinating about this story is what God does. Adam and Eve rip apart the relationship. They rip apart their covenant, their promises to God. They rip apart the partnership. And God goes looking for his friends. He knows something has happened. He knows exactly what has happened. He can feel it in the depths of his being that there has been a rupture. And he goes looking for them because he wants to save them. God pursues them in order to save them. You see, he knows that if Adam and Eve now eat from the tree of life, they are going to be stuck like this forever. Stuck in sin. Stuck with this rupture between heaven and earth. Stuck with the broken parts of a relationship that was once whole and beautiful. And God doesn't want them stuck. God pursues them in order to save them. Now you could say, okay, yeah, I get that. But doesn't he also pursue them to uh, curse them? Isn't that in there too? Technically, if you look at the language, there are two things that are cursed. The serpent, which seems pretty fair, and the ground, which seems kind of unfair. But what God is saying there is that the impact of the disobedience has ripples effect far beyond Adam and Eve. 
And what he says to them are the things that were supposed to bring you just straight up joy are now going to be a lot harder. They're going to be a lot more painful. I'm, I'm making them harder for you. Bearing children, something that should just be straight up joy, is going to be hard work, something that you're supposed to get to the end of the day and feel like, that was a good day, we, we got things done, that's going to be hard for you. Adam and Eve didn't just tear apart their relationship with God, they tore apart their relationship with each other and their relationship with creation. Everything got ruined. This is not a hard thing to prove, is it? Like, look at the world. We see the defects of sin and brokenness all around us. We see how men and women, boys and girls, still struggle to understand each other. Whether that's at school or work or home or family or friendships, there's still this friction and this hard thing of coming together and trying to figure out how to live. Childbirth is hard, whether that's from trying to get pregnant all the way through labor and delivery, that is complicated and painful, even though we have amazing medical resources. I have yet to talk to a woman who has born children who says, you know, it really wasn't that big a deal. It was totally fine. But, you know, it was easy. No big deal at all, start to finish. I usually hear like, I threw up every day for nine months. I've had two friends for whom that was their experience, so yee. Complicated, painful. Work is complicated and painful. Even when we have stand-up desks, right? Nail guns, laser cutters, it's still painful. It's hard. You gotta solve problems. You gotta figure, you gotta work with people. Oh my goodness. Work is hard. And our bodies, our bodies get diseased and they get broken and they wear out. And creation, creation groans because of what we have done and what we have left undone. Scientists said this week that 2020 was one of the hottest years on record. Part of the seven last years were the hottest seven years on record. Creation groans because of what we have done and what we have left undone. What Adam and Eve did was come into God's beautiful and orderly creation and just ruin it, rip it apart, introduce chaos into everything. And what God could do, what Genesis 3 could be the story of, is God storming into the garden and grabbing Adam and Eve by the scruffs of their neck and throwing them out. It could be the story of God coming into the garden and saying, now you will be my slaves. It could be that story. It could be the story of God's righteous anger. But it's not. God pursues them in order to save them. And then did you notice what he did next? He dresses them. Like a dad who puts warm socks on the feet of a toddler, God dresses them. Big leaves aren't going to cut it for you guys anymore, so let me help you out. He dresses them. He provides for them. He gives them what they are going to need for this next chapter of their lives. God pursues them. He provides for them, and then he protects them. Like a mom who puts safety locks on every single cupboard. God puts a, an angel with flaming swords like, no, 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 don't go here because God knows if they eat that tree, they're going to be stuck and he doesn't want them stuck. He wants them free. He wants them to have hope. He wants them to have a future and so God protects them. This is who God is in Genesis 3. He's not angry. In fact, in all of Genesis, God is never described as angry. God pursues them, and he provides for them, and he protects them, even though they messed up huge, even though they rebelled, even though they were completely wrong. 
This is who God is. This is who God is. Even when we mess up, even when we rebel, even when we are completely wrong, this is still who God is. God pursues us. Some of you know that God's pursuing you. You can feel it. You, you know he's, he's after you. He wants your heart. He wants you to commit. He wants you to turn over all of your life to him. You know that God is pursuing you, and you're a little anxious about that because you think, well, what is he going to do when he gets me? You could be afraid. But this text teaches us, no, you don't have to be. Because while the fall messed up me and it messed up you, it did not mess up God. God's love for you is persistent. He pursues you because he will do anything it takes to be in relationship with you and to take that relationship deeper, more intimate than it's been in the past. If God is knocking on your heart, it's not necessarily to convict you of sin, although that may be a part of it. If he does convict you of sin, it is that so you can lead a healthier life, a better life, a life more intimate with him than you've led in the past. He could be pursuing you to say, look, I've got a plan for you. Listen to me. Look, I've got a word for you. Look, I've got someone in your life that I need you to just care for. God pursues us because he was, won't let anything stand in the way of a relationship between him and us. He pursues us. And God provides for us. God's provided for some of us through AA. He's provided for us through divorce recovery groups. He's provided for us through this other person who went through chemo just like we went through chemo. I was talking with a friend yesterday about car payments, randomly. And he started to talk about a time in his life when his finances were very lean. And he said, I have no idea how I paid rent, made my car payment, and had any groceries at all when I was making less than 10 bucks an hour. He's like, I, I don't know how that happened. And we both kind of fell silent and said, only God. Some of you have experienced that kind of financial provision when just the right amount shows up just when you need it. God provides. And this year we've seen God's provision in teachers that adapt, God bless them, in grandparents who become masters at the Zoom call, they're like Zoom call ninjas. We've seen it in people who wear masks to protect our health. We've seen God's provision and we know of God's protection. God's protection for us is ever-present. Now, we may want to say, well, you know, he didn't really protect me when I was in this car accident. Like, what was that about? Well, God's protection isn't like that. It's, it's not just for the everyday things, although we see it in everyday things. God's protection is a deep protection, not unlike a vaccine, timely illustration. He gives us a vaccine so that sin, although it will impact us, although it will make us sick, it will not kill us. Through the life, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, God protects us from the deadly scheme of the enemy, the deadly scheme of the liar. And this was the promise that he made way back when to Adam and Eve. They didn't know what he was talking about. I will put hatred between you and the snake and the offspring, and he's going to crush your head, and you're going to strike his heel. They didn't know. They're like, well, that's weird. Okay. But we know. We know what God was talking about in that moment. When all of his world had been disrupted, when there had been this terrible tearing apart, he already began to knit things back together through Jesus Christ. He already began to say, someday... 
that liar will be crushed. Someday the enemy will be completely destroyed. Someday death and hell will be no more. Someday God pursues us so that he can save us. God seeks us. God provides for us. God protects us. So as you go out into your week, whatever your week may look like, sitting and staring at screens or shoveling snow or watching football, whatever your week includes, pay attention to how God shows up. Ask the people that you live with, how is God pursuing you? How do you see God's provision? How is God protecting you? Talk about the shared story. This isn't the only place we talk about the shared story. It really doesn't mean much if it just ends right here. What does the shared story look like in your marriage and with your kids and in your classrooms and in your work? The shared story teaches us about who our God is, the God who pursues, the God who provides, the God who protects. This is your God. Blessed be his holy name. Will you pray with me? Thank you, thank you, thank you, God, that you don't storm in and grab us and throw us out. Thank you that even in our sin, you pursue us in order to save us. Thank you that you continue to provide for us even when we ignore it. That you protect us from the biggest threat. Thank you for being our God. Thank you, Jesus, for the sacrifice you made to make things right. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for constantly nudging us to become more and more like Jesus. May we all raise up our hands and say, I was hiding God, but here I am. Here I am. Give us that courage, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.